we are back to wrap up the iBook clamshell project. In part one, we did a full teardown on this unit and confirmed that the PMU or power management unit issues were due to a leaky supercapacitor. There was some pretty bad leakage on the underside of the board that we cleaned up, and I placed an order online for a replacement so that we can get this machine working properly again. If you haven't seen it already, part one's linked in the description below. Here we have the replacement 0.33 farad supercapacitor rated at 5.5 volts. I got this from Mauser, it arrived fairly quickly. And I also decided to replace the mechanical drive in this laptop with an SSD. Here I have this 16 gigabyte MSATA SSD that's gonna go in this IDE enclosure. Very inexpensive setup here. No one's buying 16 gig MSATA SSDs. This is basically e-waste at this point. And like I mentioned last time, this machine would have originally come with a 10 gigabyte hard drive. So 16 gigs is both age and era appropriate for this machine. That's going to slot in right where the previous hard drive came out. I've already thoroughly cleaned the board with some IPA. All the leakage and prior residue from the leaky capacitor should be gone, so we just need to clean out the previous solder from the hole so that we can slot the new capacitor in. As soon as I started introducing some leaded solder, I noticed that the top hole wasn't really taking any solder. There was quite a bit of leakage down here, and the faulty capacitor gave me a hard time coming out, but I did my best to introduce some solder and wick it up with some braid like I normally do. It almost looks like there's a component leg stuck in there, but that's not the case, the capacitor came out clean. I went at it again a few times off camera, introducing more leaded solder each time and try to wick it up with some braid, but I just wasn't getting good thermal transfer. Here the braid just stuck to the board. Anytime this happens with solder braid, you can just introduce more solder to release it from the board. The last thing you want to do is pull it and risk ripping any traces off the pads. I was also gradually increasing the temperature on my iron with each attempt, but this pad just wasn't having it. I moved on to the other side and I was actually able to clear the hole from the very first attempt. This is what I expect, more or less. This is actually a pretty high quality braid, I'm using good flux, good solder. So even though this pad looks fine on the surface, I know that the leakage has done a number on this board. After a few more failed attempts, it was clear that the wick just wasn't going to work on that top hole. So I reintroduced some solder and flux and decided to take out the desoldering iron. I'm not a huge fan of the desoldering iron that I have. It doesn't have a temperature control and it runs really hot. But one way or another, I needed to clear this hole. And even with the desoldering iron, it didn't work the first time. But after a couple of attempts, I finally managed to clear it out. That was more painful than I expected, but my woes were not over with this pad. As you're about to see, it was going to continue to give me a hard time, and what was supposed to be a quick capacitor swap turned into quite the arduous task. New capacitor pops right in, being mindful of the polarity. And should be as easy as introducing a little flux and soldering the legs right in. Now this is going to be a little bit more clear in some of the upcoming shots because I do zoom in so that you guys can see the work up close. But in a nutshell, I kept getting what appeared to be a cold solder joint on that top pad. The bottom pad looked great, I got really good wetting, but that top pad just wasn't having it. It never quite looked right. So clearly the capacitor leakage has done a little bit more damage than meets the eye. It's possible it's eaten through some of the copper down the through hole, or the oxidation is just so deep that I wasn't getting good thermal transfer. This is not meant to be a difficult soldering job. Under normal circumstances, this would have taken a couple of minutes. But I'm keeping my trials and tribulations here for you guys to see. When you're fixing things, this is the kind of stuff you come across. I still wasn't happy with that joint, but let's clean it up and take a closer look. So here you can see the pad on the left. It looks like a pyramid. It's shiny compared to the one on the right, which kind of looks like a lollipop. It's almost like there's a ball sitting on top of that joint. It does look to be making contact. It is actually anchored to the board. It's not moving, but it's just not a good joint. It doesn't look right. 
and the continuity check with the nearby ground, it shows that it is making a connection. But I want to fix it properly once and for all. I don't want this joint to fatigue and break over time. So I decided to use an old component leg and run a jumper wire to the nearby ground. After bending it to shape and trimming it to size, I'm going to solder it in so it's a lasting repair. There's probably more than one way you could do this. You could start scraping some solder resist away and expose some copper. I have a nice big ground nearby. There aren't any components in the way. So I think running a short jumper wire is going to work out well here. It's a little fidgety. I'm on 300 Celsius right here, so the temperature is not too hot. And there we go. First side's anchored in. It doesn't need to look pretty right now. We'll come back and clean that up. Let's just get the other side anchored in first. All right, there we go little bit more flux. Let's go back and make it look nice. And continuity check. Always a good practice when you're doing trace repair. Make sure we have a connection to ground and we don't have any shorts nearby. Pretty happy with how it turned out, looks clean, and more importantly, hopefully I won't have to be opening up this machine again. Now if you remember from last week's teardown, whoever replaced the hard drive on this machine previously left the aluminum shield pretty mangled up. I used the jaws of a small adjustable wrench to bend everything back into place, just anything to give me some leverage without creating awkward pressure points and bending the aluminum too far and I used a small block of wood to iron out any bulges in the shield. Alright, that's looking pretty good. It's flat in all the right places, especially where it's going to be dissipating heat from some of the chips that it's going to be touching underneath. Nothing left to do, but put it back together and test it out. Battery's still charging, looks good there. The question is, will it turn on when I press the power button? That was a bit of a delayed reaction. I was a little bit nervous there for a second, but unlike before, the computer started right up without any special key presses or reset procedures. Replacing that supercapacitor resolved the power issues that this computer was having with its PMU. Here I have the original restore disks to install Mac OS 9. I'm gonna do most of that off camera. All we need to do is power cycle the unit and press C while it's starting up to boot from the CD-ROM. There we go. All right, let's skip ahead. The only quick thing I want to show is how to initialize a new hard disk in Mac OS 9. Under Utilities and Drive Setup, we're going to see an unmounted volume. All you need to do is initialize it. I'm going to leave all 16 gigs on one partition. And just like that, now there is an untitled volume on the desktop. And in true Apple fashion, restoring the OS is just as simple. All we need to do is open up Apple Software Restore and press the Restore button. That's it. A final warning, letting me know it's going to erase the contents of the drive, hit OK, and about half an hour or so later, we have a fully restored iBook Clamshell G3 with an upgraded SSD. 
I'm thrilled to own one of these machines, especially one in this good a condition, and I'm glad I was able to fix it properly and get it working again. It's one of those machines that's historically significant in terms of Apple products and just pop culture in general, and it really is a treat to use Mac OS 9 and recreate that experience that someone would have had 20 years ago using a machine like this. Well guys, that concludes this particular project. If you made it this far, say I made it to the end in the comments below. And anyone that does that within 72 hours of this video being uploaded is going to be entered into a draw to win an iFixit Mako driver bit set. I'll announce the winner at the beginning of my next upload. One entry per person. I'll ship it worldwide. This is the same kit I bought for myself last year right before I started this channel and I absolutely love it. And no, this isn't sponsored. I wish. I'm buying this with my own money. I'm just excited that you guys are excited and I'm having a blast creating these videos. So I'm going to start celebrating milestones with you guys, big and small, with giveaways that I announce up front and some impromptu ones like the one here today. Until then, take care guys and I'll see you again soon.